This vlog is a visual representation of the reasoning and coaching process that I've used with three different athletes with either a capacity or a skill-based limitation preventing athletic development. The key narrative in this video is twofold. Weightlifting based activities in the weight room can be affected by low task experience of the actual skill and poor movement patterning of the task. A central tenet of this hypothesis is that skill based limitations are more acutely correctable than capacity limitations because of neuroplasticity and motor relearning. This can be achieved via manipulation of environmental constraints and kinesthetic correction to aid motor relearning. Secondly, that in the example of the second and third athlete, a capacity limitation can be improved by deconstructing the skill, providing you have an understanding of the kinetics, kinematics, primary musculature involved in the component parts of the movement task. This analysis can help to optimize secondary training transfer to the primary skill. This will be shown in the second and third athlete example. The first athlete is a 28-year-old recreational competitive cross-country runner who has femoral acetabular impingement preventing a deep squat but who has expressed a desire to improve her lower limb explosiveness. She has a very low resistance training age, having never been involved in a formal strength or power development program. There is evidence to suggest that subjects with a low resistance training age experience practically meaningful improvements in lower limb explosiveness with strength training. During the squat with a loaded Olympic bar, this athlete displays a reduction in the range of motion on the descent phase of the squat. While her overall form is relatively good according to the technical model for the squat based upon the athlete's goals, pathology and bony morphology, the depth of the transition between the descent and ascent phase does not meet the criteria of optimal performance. This on phase value could be argued as either a capacity or a skill limitation, however I have explained why this is unlikely to be a primary capacity problem. There are several capacity limitations that could affect squat performance, most notably limited range of motion at either the hip, knee, ankle or spine, which can affect the kinematic profile of the technical model. There are also factors in relation to kinetics that can affect various stages of the technical model, contributing to impaired performance. In the case of mobility restrictions, these are clearly not an issue as the athlete displays appropriate range of motion at the knee, hip and ankle joints in planar movements. Also, it is evident that when combined movements are co-located into a functional range of motion, the athlete displays appropriate range of motion in the critical joints without difficulty. This is again evident during the squat when a 15 kilogram bar is added to the athlete. However, when a 20 kilogram load is added to the athlete's bar, it's here that we start to see a reduction in the range of motion. It would be easy to view this reduction in range of motion as a capacity limitation because of inappropriate force production. However, the athlete displays what might be explained as kinesiophobic tendencies to this particular activity because of a lack of task experience squatting with 20 kilograms. In essence, she is restricting her movement to where she feels it is safe because she has limited proprioceptive awareness, this being her first time back squatting with a 20 kilogram load. Therefore, to cue an increase in depth for the athlete, an environmental constraint is introduced using a chair and a weight plate to increase the athlete's sense of security. This also has the additional benefit of increasing the appropriate sense of awareness as to when the appropriate depth is reached. This is a derivative exercise which can be progressed by lowering the height of the constraint dependent upon the athlete's rate of skill acquisition. At the end of the session, the athlete is squatting to horizontal using a chair as a proprioceptive cue. This was achieved in one training session, which provides evidence that this is a skill-related impairment rather than a capacity limitation. The second case is a semi-professional football player with posterior lateral buttock pain. During the squat, the athlete is unable to achieve appropriate hip flexion depth because of what appears to be a limitation of ankle dorsiflexion. This causes a corresponding forward inclination of the trunk shifting the centre of gravity forwards in relation to its base of support and a suboptimal tibial progression angle. In this case, the mobility restrictions are clearly not an issue at the knee and hip joint in planar movements as the athlete demonstrates appropriate passive and active range of motion. However, when ankle dorsiflexion is assessed, the athlete displays a clear capacity limitation. This is also evident when accessory movement testing of the talocleural joint is assessed in different positions by a physiotherapist.
Further evidence of the capacity's limitation is also evidence when an environmental constraint is included to artificially increase dorsiflexion. The depth of the squat increases, the position of the centre of mass moves posteriorly, and the athlete is closer to the technical model. This reduces forward inclination to trunk and improves the tibial progression angle, as seen in the pre and post images. The derivative exercises chosen to improve the athlete's capacity limitations include static stretching of the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles, specific soft tissue self mobilizations of the gastroc and soleus muscles, and self mobilizations of the talocrural joint utilizing both accessory and physiological movements. This is to improve primarily the athlete's soft tissue compliance and joint accessory movement. The third case study is a recreational hockey player with a capacity limitation that displays a lack of hip abduction and unilateral core muscle strength. This prevents her from optimally expressing the split squat skill to achieve a secondary training transfer to her dysfunctional squat skill, which is a painful drag flick. This injured athlete has groin pain and posterior lateral buttock pain. Whether or not this is deemed a skill or capacity limitation requires judgment on the part of the practitioner. I would argue that in this situation the problem is impaired muscle force production or strength rather than a skill limitation as the athlete demonstrates reasonable performance of the skill without an external load. There is additional evidence of this function of the force producing musculature supporting the skill when one views the athlete's inability to hold a long lever side plank. However, when the lever is shortened, the force demands reduce and skill improves, again supporting evidence of a capacity impairment. The gluteus medius muscle isometric strength measurements using a dynamometer on the dysfunctional side was 33% reduced compared to the contralateral side. The derivative exercises used to improve this athlete's performance in the split squat included an exercise prescription for isolated strength of the hip abductors inside line with a long lever, the side plank and also a straight plank. The hip abductors assist with control of the femur in the sagittal plane by virtue of their combined action of hip abduction and external rotation. The side plank utilises concentric muscle work to overcome the inertia of the trunk, then isometric work to maintain spinal neutral position, followed by eccentric muscle work to return to the start position. The plank utilises a similar muscle action pattern to assist with secondary training transfer. Both joint exercises were started in short lever positions and then progressed to long lever positions to increase the mechanical advantage. The evidence of effect and change in capacity is seen in the improvement in the split squat skill with a unilateral load. The final athlete, again a semi-professional football player, displays a skill limitation during the unilateral loaded split squat. The athlete displays a significant loss of optimal sagittal plane alignment evidenced by valgus collapse of the femur in the sagittal plane. This athlete has no morphological abnormalities at the femur. Optimal performance of this task will display control of the femur in the sagittal plane within reasonable limits. Further evidence to support a skill limitation is provided when the athlete demonstrates suboptimal performance of a split squat without an external load. The derivative exercises used to improve this athlete's performance in the split squat include an exercise prescription involving practicing the skill without external load in front of a mirror to provide visual feedback of the movement error. The movement pattern is then challenged with reactive neuromuscular techniques with bands and mirrors to further challenge the neural pathways. Then this technique is progressed with the reintroduction of an external load. Then the mirror is eventually removed. In conclusion, skills in the weight room can be affected by low task experience of the actual skill and poor motor patterning of the task. A central tenet of this hypothesis is that skill-based limitations are more acutely correctable than capacity limitations because of neuroplasticity and motor relearning. This can be achieved by manipulation of the environmental constraints and kinesthetic correction to aid motor relearning. Secondly, that the capacity impairments can be improved by deconstructing the skill, providing you have an understanding of the kinetics, kinematics and primary musculature involved in, and also the component parts of the movement task. This analysis can help to optimise the secondary training transfer to the primary skill.